All righty, everyone, if you want to make your way in through those doors, that'd be great. We're about to start our service. Uh, just a quick reminder, like I said a couple minutes ago, we have a pretty full service. So if you find a single seat beside you, if you want to just scoot over and squish so that we have some extra rows, uh, extra seats on the end of the rows, or we can free up some rows just to make sure everyone gets a seat for this service, that would be amazing and a huge blessing to those coming in just a few minutes late. And often with our James North family, that's how we roll anyways. <laughs> um, okay, my name is, oh, it's not on the screen anymore, but not, my name is uh, Michaela. The kids downstairs know me as Miss Michaela. I have the privilege of being the children's ministry director here at James North. Um, we have quite a few announcements this morning. Um, the first is we have a snack Sunday, which is kind of a bit of a tradition for us here at James North. So after the service today, there will be some snacks out near uh, the coffee section. If you want to just hang out and have some extra time of fellowship just to start off of our year, that would be super special. As well as it is name take Sunday. So if you didn't see um, the plastic table out by the doors, there's some name tags. If you want to go down, write your name. There's a lot of new faces out with the new year, so it's just super helpful as we get to know one another if we have names to connect to faces. Um, I am terrible at names, so this is a huge help to me. I'm sure there's a few more people like that in the crowd today. Alrighty. Oh, here we go. Perfect. Um, so if you are new to James, if this is your first Sunday or maybe last Sunday was your first Sunday at the beginning of the year, we would love to connect with you and get to know you, uh, me as well as the rest of the leadership team here at James. One way we can do that is with our KIT cards. So KIT stands for keeping in touch. We would love to keep in touch with you or connect with you for the first time. There's a black table right outside the doors there with some cards. You fill out that information and you can either drop it off at the off. Uh, the office or the offering box um, right outside the doors, and we will have someone from the church get connected with you. As well as if you've been coming here for a long time and you've maybe moved or there's a little bit um, of information that has changed, you can update one of those cards and put it in there, and we'll update it in our system uh, just to keep track of uh, what's happening with everyone. Alrighty, um, we also have our women's conference coming up soon. So the women's conference this year is from November 16th to 18th. It's being put on by the Gospel Coalition, um, which is an organization that we've partnered with before. And there is a cutoff date, I believe, yes. So October 1st is our cutoff date. Um, there is a barcode up there. If you want to scan that and just put your name down, uh, I think they're trying to figure out how many of the women are going to figure out carpooling and pricing and all of that. So the sooner you can let uh, the women's team know that you're coming, the better, just for admin purposes. Um, another administrative thing we got going on uh, soon also has to do with October 1st is our finance meeting. Uh, this is just giving us a rundown of what goes kind of behind the scenes of James North. So this is for uh, members who are part of the church, but as well as if you're just curious about how we uh, steward our money, this is a really helpful event to uh, come out to uh, just to get a bit of a rundown. So that's on October 1st. It will be held here starting at 6.30. Um, another, uh, another announcement for this morning is about growing and serving at James North. So we think it's very important as a church body to uh, not only serve our, fellows, our fellow brother and sisters in Christ, but also to grow together as brothers and sisters in Christ. So there's a few ways that you can do this. And if you're curious and there's a lot of information right now and you're like, I don't remember anything she just said, there are a bunch of posters with QR codes um, about growing and serving out in the foyer, they're plastered everywhere. Jenna did an awesome job with that. So if you don't remember anything I'm about to say, you can go scan those, or if you want to sign up for an event. So one way you can connect and grow as a church family or as just someone coming into the church is through our community groups. Our community groups meet weekly, and they're just a time to open the word together, pray together, and really walk through life together. Uh, now to get connected with a community group, we, um, we do require that you do Discovering James North. Discovering James North is a first, first step class, basically, to get to know our church, to get to know what we're about, what we believe in, 
Um, and just so you understand um, our perspective of the gospel and the Lord, and just so you understand what it means for us to have fellowship together. Uh, so we do ask that you do Discovering James North, which I believe some classes are coming up soon. Uh, there's some information, in, if you scan the Grow QR code, you can get some information on the dates um, for those, and then we can get you connected to a community group for the year. Um, so we have growing, we also have serving. Now, I'm not going to lie, I'm going to be a little bit biased here. Um, kids ministry has a lot of ministries that go on throughout the year, and we have had some amazing volunteers sign up for um, a bunch of different ministries in the church. Uh, one that has a bit of a gap still is our Kids Zone. Kids Zone runs on Tuesday nights. It starts at 6.30. Um, and the best way to explain what Kids Zone is, is basically it's a mini version of camp. It's kind of a camp day squished into one evening um, for uh, the kids of our church, the kids of our community. These are often, Kids Zone is often the ministry where kids will invite uh, neighbors or friends from school out, and it's a great evangelism opportunity. But we need a few more volunteers for that. You can either come talk to me or you can scan the QR code um, to get connected to serve at Kids Zone, as well as there's other areas where you're interested in serving, whether that's on the worship team or in hospitality. You can also scan that QR code and get more information on that. Alrighty, another way uh, you can serve, um, that's kind of a partnership a little bit uh, with James North. So this is not a James North ministry, but we have a few people in the congregation that are super passionate about this. Actually, if I can get... Uh, Sarah Gilman and Kellyanne, just to stand up so we know who you guys are. If you're here, I don't see. Awesome. Sarah's right there. Um, so Friendship Meals um, is a really cool way just to invite uh, students into your home and show them uh, the love of Christ and just the gift of hospitality. Uh, and Sarah and Kelly are both very involved uh, with this ministry. It's, it's an awesome partnership uh, just to meet some new people and share the love of Christ with them. So if you're interested in that, uh, I believe the cutoff is September 26th just to handle the administrative part of that. Uh, you can, Sarah or Kelly would be happy to talk uh, with you and connect you with that ministry. Alrighty, I got one more. Um, <laughs> in a couple of weeks, we have our Thanksgiving Sunday, October 8th. We're going to do a really special service. We're going to connect our Karen congregation with our James North congregation, and we're going to do worship together um, and just connect with one another, as well as I believe uh, Pastor Close and Pastor Paul are going to do a joint uh, message. So we're just going to get together with our Karen congregation. If you don't know who they are, they are... Um, a group that meets on Sunday afternoons, and they're a partner church that we support and work with. Uh, and this is a super, a very special Sunday for us just to connect with them, because although we meet usually on Sundays at different times, they are as well our brothers and sisters in Christ. On that Thanksgiving Sunday, we also have a potluck. So right now is a good time to start thinking about what you want to bring um, to bless everyone else in this room as well as our Quran congregation because we're just going to meet out there and just break some bread together and have a time of fellowship after uh, that joint service. Okay, I think, I think that I'm done. I think that's all of them. Um, I'm going to get you all to stand and I'm just going to read some scripture to open us up in our time of worship this morning. Psalm 73, verses 23 to 28. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Lord, thank you that we can enter your house this morning. Lord, thank you that we can gather together as believers and sing praise and worship to you. Lord, may we just recognize uh, your goodness this morning, Lord. May we just recognize your sovereignty this morning, Lord. 
May we recognize that our flesh and our heart may fail, God, um, but you are our portion forever. May we know that as we sing out these worship songs, Lord. Um, may, may this truth stir in our heart uh, that you are good, that you are God, and that we can sing of your good works forever.
that's our hope when the night is over.
God, our Father, we thank you that we celebrate your faithfulness, your goodness, that you demonstrate your grace to us in so many different ways. Thank you for gathering us here this morning. May you continue to watch over us and bless us in all that will take place now. Amen. You may be seated, except for uh, Laura DeJong and Curtis Elkema. Laura and Curtis, where are you guys? Are they here? I thought they were going to be here. Are they out in the... Well, I'll do this without them then. <laughs> I need to... No, you know what? I've got the wrong date. This is only the 17th. There's so many other things. Well, next week, they'll stand up for us. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to ask two other people to stand up with me. Dave Gray and Katie Gray, would you come up here? As uh, if... If you've been living in a cave or something, <laughs> this is a surprise to you this morning. Uh, you know that we are in the process of bringing a new pastor to you. Here he is, <laughs> all right? If you haven't had a chance to meet him, you guys have a seat. Uh, we're just going to talk for a little bit this morning. Uh, they have been in a whole variety of situations over the past couple of days, meeting a great number of you already. They've been in some homes and kind of smaller groups and everything like that. You're all here this morning. We wanted to take a few minutes to uh, introduce them by way of just getting the talk a little bit this morning. And as we do that after the service, you can take some time and greet them more. Uh, there's a members meeting this evening that our members are going to be asked to vote on God's confirmation of this call. And so at 7.30 tonight, members, you are invited to be back here, and we will have kind of that official meeting and voting time. But this is a time just to get to know you guys a little bit and uh, share about how God's leading us forward in this ministry partnership. And it has been great getting to know you over the past few days. Uh, I appreciate that. And it's, uh, it's hard because you've probably been asked these things, I don't know how many times already, but here we go again, all right? That's right. Well, I could probably share the story now. <laughs> but it's nice to hear it from your voice. So let, let's just start off. Katie, introduce your family to us. Tell us who you guys are. Hi. Well, thanks for having us. It's great to be here. We're really excited. Um, I'm Katie. This is Dave. We've been married for 25 years. And we have three children. Um, our oldest, Hannah, is uh, 21. And she is a student at Brock University. And she's actually doing a semester in England. Um, so actually, she was hoping to join us online this morning oh. um, from an airport in Rome. So hopefully uh, she's there. <laughs> hi, Katie. We hope you're Hannah, there yeah. in Rome. All right. <laughs> um, our son, James, is 19. He is a student at Fleming College. He's in his second year of drilling, of the drilling program. And our youngest daughter, Emily, who's here as well, is 17. Or, sorry, almost 17. <laughs> Uh, and she's in grade 12. Thank you. James and Emily have been great. They've kind of tagged along with the, these guys to a lot of different meetings here with us this morning. You can bombard them with love and care afterwards. It really embarrass them, but... Okay. <laughs> Maybe not. You know that is not correct. James, feel free to run back to the offices if we get carried away in any of that kind of stuff. Uh, it's been wonderful getting to know you. Tell us, uh, we just wanted to know a little bit about your faith journey, okay? So just start to talk to us about how, how, well, how did you meet Jesus, first of all? Tell yeah, us about that. I, I grew up in a, in a Christian home. We were in church every Sunday. Uh, I grew up with a brother in church in Oshawa. And uh, until I was about grade seven, when I was about six or seven years old, my, my mom would read uh, the Bible. I would pray every night, and uh, we'd pray together. And I remember one night... Uh, I just said, I want to ask Jesus in my heart. And uh, we, we did that at a young age, uh, I guess at six or seven, but um, you know, growing up, going through high school, uh, it really though was at a young adult retreat up at Joy Bible Camp in uh, Bancroft, where um, sort of recommitted my life in a real way, and uh, after that got baptized and, and uh, continued on serving in our local church. Uh, Katie, why don't you give us sure. your quick story too? Um, and I also grew up in a Christian home too loving Christian mom and dad and accepted Christ as my savior at a young age. And Dave and I met at church at Calvary Baptist in Oshawa. So I was baptized there as well. Um, summer camp played a big role in my faith journey. Um, served at Minioe for a few years. And, uh, yeah, good old Minioe. Good old Minioe. <laughs> How many are Minioe alumni here? 
Not many of you. You've missed a great adventure. How many at Wajidawan? Oh, more at Wajidawan. The rest of you, what's wrong with well, you? Joy, joy Bible Camp. That oh, was Joy Bible one. Camp. There's probably a chunk of Joy Bible Camp. Pioneer Camp. Oh, where am I going with this? That has nothing to do with it. That's right. The last two Summer Sundays I've had great. stand yeah. and sit to identify yourselves. Okay, I'm going off on a tangent here. Tell us now just that sort of ministry life. How did God uh, call you guys into pastoral ministry? Because you didn't start as a pastor. No, I, I had a sense when I was in high school that full-time ministry was in my future, uh, but it never seemed like the right time. And I finished high school and uh, ended up going to Durham College for business, and I became a computer programmer. And uh, so really for seven years, I worked in IT support, software development at GM in Oshawa. Uh, plant floor support, quality systems, all that. And uh, in that time, we got married and started having kids. And so the whole ministry idea kind of was in the back of my head and kind of off the back burner and figuring out with young children, it's not a good time to make a switch from you know working in front of a computer screen to doing this. Um, and yet the Lord really, uh, he changed our direction for us in the span of one week. And so in one week, there was three events. And we say it was a sermon, a ceremony and a celebration. Uh, and the sermon was actually our, our adult ministries pastor was preaching on living the simple life. And uh, it was interesting because at that point um, we had the, the two kids and they were young and, and kids are always getting sick. And so I said, I'll stay home this Sunday. And Katie was able to go to church and she came home and she said, you've got to listen to this message. It just really sort of impacted her in a, in a, in a way. And I listened to it as well. And we, we kind of realized we had just moved in six months before into like what was going to be our forever home. Uh, we had a house built and we were going to live there and retire there, raise our kids there. And, um, and so this simple life message really sort of impacted us. Um, but then the following Saturday, we were at a wedding, uh, one of Katie's friends from Minioe. Woo! Um, uh, she was getting married and actually her, her, they moved the wedding up a couple of months because uh, her mother was actually um, nearing the end of her battle with cancer and and sadly, she, she did pass shortly after the wedding. Um, but at the, at the reception, she stood up to speak about what she saw in her daughter. And I don't know if you, if you have the same sense as me, but when someone who's at that point in their life speaks, you listen. And she talked about the faith she saw in her daughter and how she was willing to step out in faith to go live and work at camp full time, live on support. And, uh, and it was really impactful to hear her talk about what she wished she had have done. And here we are, we heard this sermon last week on living a simple life, and now we're hearing this, this, this woman talk, talking about living by faith. And, uh, and that, was, that wedding was in Toronto. We had to drive all, all the way back to Oshawa after that, and, and it was a good chance for us to talk. And, and we, we still didn't really know what God was trying to get at us, but he was saying something to us. And then this next day was Sunday, and we were actually celebrating at the church the retirement of our pastor to seniors. And part of that morning celebration, they they had people share about how Wally and Betty had actually impacted their lives and how they built into them and, and, and built into their Christian journey. And we came home that afternoon and we both kind of looked at each other and said, I think it's time. It was kind of the Lord revealed to the both of us that it was time for us to figure out how to go from being a, a computer programmer to being in ministry. And so we, uh, we, we, we engaged our senior pastor who, interestingly enough, last week, I was able to go and be part of his retirement service. Yeah. Um, but we talked to him, and he encouraged us in, in ministry. He, 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 he um, affirmed us in ministry. And, uh, and from that point on, we just have watched how the Lord led us from place to place, uh, serving and growing um, in our ministry. Yeah, so that's been... It, I love the story of how God works some of those things out. And it's for, you know, as you hear that story, like any of you can be called into ministry at any point. You might become an engineer, you might become a doctor, you might be a nurse. God can move you yep. in other ways as he trains and, and prepares you for that. Uh, brief ministry history, you know, so God yep. moved you that way. Yeah, what so I mean, as far as, as my, my ministry, I, I did an, a, like a one-year internship at our home church in Oshawa, Calvary Baptist, where it was great. I could go and just learn the work, because I knew the people, and that was really wonderful. Um, but then the Lord called us to Cambridge, um, 
Now, honestly, I thought I was going into ministry to work in a technical ministry, right? I, I did say I was a bit of a nerd, um, computer programmer, and I thought I'd be going to a big church where I'd be like doing sound and lighting and, you know, all the networking and websites and all that kind of stuff. And, and in, our, in, in a, part of that first year, um, Katie was able to go to a children's ministry conference. And uh, when she went, she, she was introduced to an author named Mark Holman, who wrote a book called Faith Begins at Home. And, it, and it's a really, it's a, it's a great read. It's, it's an older book now, but I would highly encourage any parent to read Faith Begins at Home. But it really, as we went through that, we realized the Lord had more for us. And so I, I began sort of looking towards a family ministry role. Um, and so for seven years, I was uh, the pastor to family and children in Cambridge at uh, Cedar Creek Community Church. And um, the Lord really grew us as a family and grew me in my ministry. And, uh, and so after about seven years, it was about time for, you know, kind of what's next for me at that point. I was looking for more preaching opportunities. So we were looking at what the Lord had for us. And, um, and a church in Fenland Falls of all places, Fenland Falls Baptist Church. Anyone know where Fenland Falls is? Oh, I know more a couple than of people actually live there. <laughs> uh, but Fenland Falls is kind of straight north of Oshawa. And, uh, and so they, they called me to come and be their associate pastor to uh, work with and serve with their senior pastor who had been there 37 years uh, when he retired, um, to work with him. And then we'd swap roles. I'd become the senior pastor. He'd become the associate. Then he'd retire. Um, and so we started that way. And then for about two months, we worked in that plan. And then we got a phone call from our region, uh, uh, Bob Fleming from Feb Center, who said, hey, um, your sister church and Bob Cajun is, is going to need some help. They're going to call you for how you can help them. In fact, they might call you looking for a merger. And so here we are at um, what I thought was a little country church, now taking on the potential of taking on another church and, and making some kind of a partnership merger a multi-site church in cottage country of all places. Um, but it's been really interesting to watch how the Lord has worked in that place. Um, it took us a couple of years to figure things out, but now for the last seven years, we've been working as this one church in two locations. And uh, when, when Bob Cajun called us, uh, it was Village Baptist Church, they called us, they were about 20 people meeting on a Sunday. And... Um, and praise God, last Sunday we broke 400 between the two churches. Wow. So that church of 20 has grown uh, 10 times to 200 people. And, uh, and, and uh, from my perspective, where I sit in that, in that ministry, I, I'm amazed at what God's done. Because uh, I, know, I know what we haven't done to, to build it. But mm -hmm. I know that Jesus promised to build his church. And, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful story of his, his faithfulness, his goodness. Yeah. Amen. It's great to see those things happen. We've experienced this, mm. <laughs> what God has done here. It's just great to sit back and go, God is doing some wonderful things. Um, I don't want to take too much longer because we do want you to preach this morning <laughs> as well. But just some of your, your pastoral kind of heart and uh, as, you've, you know, as you've been in ministry for this long, we were, we were preaching on Elijah, mm. Elijah and Elisha a little while ago. You told me you listened in. You heard oh, the baldy comment. I, I appreciate the one about the go up bald head. Yeah. <laughs> you, you mentioned about listening to your bald leaders, and I appreciated that. That's I was right. Watching it. There was a preparation that was taking place in that moment. So uh, nobody use bald names. There are bears in the neighborhood. No, we won't. <laughs> in that sermon, though, the idea of ministry involves the idea of restoration, correction, and direction. Mm -hmm. How does that fill out? What's that been in your ministry? Yeah. Like, how does that, that, does that look for you? Thankfully, Paul gave me this ahead of time, so it's yeah. not like on the spot. But um, the restoration really is that Bob Cajun story. Mm -hmm. uh, watching how uh, God used a people to revitalize another church. And um, like I said, it's, it's been incredible watching how he's done that work. Uh, Fenland Falls was in a plan to build a new building on the outskirts of town, and... and they had been donated some land, and it was going to be like 1.2 million to begin on that free land. Um, and then the Lord sort of said, hey, no, I want you to do this instead. And, and to watch how he used us uh, as his servants to revitalize. And there was a group of about 40 of us as a launch team to, to do that. It wasn't, it wasn't me. It was a bunch of us. And, uh, and yet 
watching the revitalization, it's a big thing in the church world right now, is, is seeing all the dwindling churches that need help mm. and uh, coming alongside. So restoration for me is a little bit uh, helping the church around and being more for the kingdom and not for just this local church, right. but being yeah. in, in, in involved in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's great to see. Has there been kind of the, the idea of um, just how in your pastoral life, just that idea of alongside people, what's that look like for you? Yeah, we walk with a lot of different people. People are in different, different situations, right? People in, in marriage in crisis or just need someone to talk to. Um, I, I've got a couple of guys that I meet with regularly. We, we're kind of friends, but I'm kind of mentoring them as well. And, and well, they mentor me too, but uh, we, we spend time together just iron sharpening iron and, and uh, but just being aware that there's so many different uh, issues in people's lives. Uh, and one that's near and dear to me uh, it actually is depression. I, I have suffered through depression. Um, I won't get into that story right now because it's, it's, it could be a long one. But, mm -hmm. um, but the reality is, is the Lord let me, allowed me, and allowed us to experience that, which now means we can now help others who are going through that. And uh, it's, it's been neat to, to journey on that in that sense as well. Yeah. And I would add to our life group that we're involved in mm. too, just encouraging and helping each other. That's been a big a big part of it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to end it there. After the service, we tried to figure out for all of you to have, you know, a 10 minute conversation with them isn't going to work. <laughs> but uh, we're going to ask them to stay at the front of the con of the just sit up here or stand up here after the service. If you'd like to come and greet them personally, take some time to do that. I'm going to encourage if, as you're doing that, don't have a plan for a 20 minute conversation. Have a few minute conversation with them, greet them, welcome them. They're going to hang around. We're going to have coffee and everything. Hopefully you can mingle and do all of those kind of things. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Michaela to come up again now. She's going to dismiss our kids in a moment, but I asked her if she'd just come up and pray. And uh, she'll pray and then dismiss the kids and we'll go sit down again. Um, I was told to tell the junior highs that when the kids head out after prayer, uh, you guys can also head out. So up to grade eight is downstairs today. And also if you're a new family and you haven't signed in yet, you can find me at the registration table downstairs. God, I thank you so much uh, for the grades, Lord, and just carrying them through this very full weekend. Lord, I thank you for all of the amazing conversations that have happened and all of um, the patience that they have shown in answering the same questions over and over again to different groups, Lord. Um, yeah, I thank you for the search team and just how you have guided them through the search process this far, Lord. And as we just um, kind of enter into the rest of today, uh, would you give them, would you give the congregation discernment, Lord? And um, yeah, I also just pray for for Dave and for Katie and just their willingness and joy in being here, Lord, would you also give them uh, just a sense of peace in, in the direction that you are uh, heading them in, Lord? Um, I thank you for just the way they have willingly connected with the church family over this past weekend, um, God, and their willingness to be here and share their story, Lord, and how you've worked in them. I thank you for the ministry uh, that has been their life so far and how you have called them into vocational ministry in this partnership together and how they have served your church so faithfully, Lord. And as they step into this, this next chapter, uh, Lord, only you know what it looks like. Um, but would you continue to carry them and guide them, uh, God, and may you have the glory in their ministry. Lord, I thank you for um, connecting them to the James North family, Lord. Um, yeah, I just pray that um, we would all just have uh, the, uh, the ability and willingness to remember that this is not um, our church, but your church, God, that you are sovereign in all of that, all of this. May you remind us of that as we go into the rest of the day. In your precious and holy name, amen. amen. So as we sing, time for kids, make your way down to uh, Kingdom Kids. Let's stand together. you love 
For your mercy never fails me in all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my hand. Oh, I will say of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest nights you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the good been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able who oh, I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God all my life and all my life you have been faithful So, so good With every breath that I am able Who oh, I'm going to sing Of the goodness of God Who oh, I'm going to sing Of the goodness of God Who oh, I'm going to sing Of the goodness of God I say, you, you can be seated. That's my first instruction. <laughs> you can be seated. It's great. It really is uh, an honor for us to be here with you this morning, this weekend. It has been full, but we've enjoyed meeting so many of you. And uh, even though we had to tell the same story over and over again, we're happy to do that because it's, it's not just our story, it's the Lord's story and, and how he's been working in, in us and through us. Now, I know last week, Pastor Paul had you play a little game, right? We all stood up and Right, so I'm, I'm going to start with a game too, but I'm not going to play it fully. Um, in, in our midweek program back home, we, we call it BLAST, right? So BLAST stands for Building Lives Around Spiritual Truth. We sometimes play a game we call Would You Rather? And normally we get the kids, they would actually, you know, would you rather this or this? We'd have them go to opposite sides of the room. I won't make you do that because you may not get your seat back. But here, let's, let's play a couple of quick ones. 
Um, would you rather eat pizza with anchovies or, so pizza with anchovies or spaghetti made with spaghetti squash? What do you think? Pizza with anchovies, spaghetti or spaghetti squash. And this can get dangerous, right? Or the second one is this. Would you rather read an awesome book or would you rather watch a good movie? Read a book, watch a movie. Okay, I'm going to get a little, a little deeper for you now, and I don't want you to answer this one out loud. Okay, just, I, I, you can if you want, but I don't, I'm not looking for it. Are you more of a grace person, or are you more of a truth person? Have you ever stopped to think about that? We all have our own tendency to be more grace or more truth. And then the, the follow-up question is, where do you wish you were? Do you wish you were the other, or are you glad you are the way you are? See, I'm curious about that, but I'm not going to ask. But I think the tension here is, is we often see grace and truth as the opposite ends of a continuum, right? Almost like they're part of a balance beam, and you've got a moving fulcrum trying to keep either grace or truth balanced with the other, other piece. But I, I want to be honest with you, as I've been studying and, and reading for this message in particular, I've kind of come to the conclusion that they're not two ends of one continuum, but actually grace and truth are two separate and important attitudes, two characteristics within us. And we're going to look this morning at how Jesus is perfectly grace and truth. If you have your Bible with you, I, I'd ask you to open up to John chapter 1. We're going to have most of the scripture on the screen anyways, but if you have your Bible, open to John chapter 1. I love having my physical Bible open because I can begin to see where my favorite passages are. I, I don't know, anyone else find, you know exactly which part of the page certain verses are on? Yeah, I love that. I think it's an important piece. But if you have your Bible, John 1, we're going to look at verses 14 to 17 this morning. And I'll read them for you now. The Word became flesh, made His dwelling among us, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. We'll skip to 16. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Jesus Christ, sorry, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, before we jump in a little deeper, I just want to draw your attention to two pieces here. First, in verse 14. It tells us that Jesus is full of grace and truth. And I think it could also be, say here, he's full of grace and he's full of truth. All right? He's not just in the middle on the balance. He's full of both of them. And the second thing I want to keep in mind as we go through this is on verse 17, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. He came through Jesus. So let's go back to, to verse 14. Let's, let's just kind of walk through the verses a little bit here. The first thing we find out is that John, the author, who is one of Jesus' disciples, is talking all about Jesus. This whole book that he's writing, this gospel, is all about Jesus. And we, we look at this introduction to his book, which starts in verse 1 of chapter 1, where he talks about this idea of the word, all right? Or in the Greek, the logos, but he talks about the word. And this idea of the word could be, he may be utilizing a Greek concept at the t from the time, the idea of a divine reason. But he also might be sort of alluding to, like in the Old Testament, we see wisdom personified, right? We talk about finding wisdom, and, and, and it's sort of personified. And we, we, it might be that John's kind of using that terminology to, to draw to his sort of uh, Old Testament Jewish listeners. But he's talking all about Jesus. But he doesn't tell us Jesus' name until verse 17, right? In the verse, first verse, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? So the Word's been around forever, right? And I would say that the Word was God, but the Word is God and will always be God. In other words, the Word didn't at some point become a God. The Word is God. And there he was in the beginning with God. We find out in verse 3 of this chapter that the Word is the agent of creation. Uh, you know, he's, John's alluding to the first chapter of Genesis with this in the beginning idea. And I think he's also alluding to the fact that in Genesis 1, we start to see hints of the Trinity. 
he says here that the, the word is the one that was the agent of creation, right? So the Father, God the Father, spoke creation. God the Son did the creating. And we find in Genesis 1, again, that the, the Holy Spirit is hovering over the waters. We begin to see the Trinity together from the very beginning. We find out in this chapter also that the word, that the word is life. And that the word is the light of mankind. And like I said, in verse 17, we finally get introduced to the word. And that's Jesus Christ. So what John's talking about in this is all about Jesus. The verse goes on and tells us that the word became flesh. The creator became the creation. And he willingly took on that flesh to come and be on the earth with us. He didn't just simply appear like us, he became like one of us. I mean, he was born as a baby to Mary and Joseph. He grew up in Nazareth. He had to learn just like you and I had to learn. In fact, Jesus even was tempted just like you and I get tempted. But there's one huge difference. Jesus did that without ever sinning. And I don't know about you, maybe you're different than me, but I can't fathom what it would be like to feel sinlessness he became flesh and it goes on he made his dwelling among us he didn't come as a king already as an adult in royal robes living in a palace giving us directives he came and he actually lived among us like i said he grew up in nazareth he he worked as a carpenter with his father he got hungry so he ate He got tired, so he slept. He walked this world with others. And his whole ministry was with others, his disciples and the people he came in contact with. And then it tells us that Jesus showed us his glory. John says, we have seen his glory. Which is interesting because we're also told that Jesus didn't point to himself. Did you realize that? Often in his early ministry, he, he would say to someone, like he might heal someone or, or uh, uh, remove a demon, and he'd say, like, don't tell anyone. This is a secret for you and me right now. Now, the person who was healed or, or had the demon removed couldn't keep quiet, and they'd go and tell whoever they could tell. But Jesus kind of said, like, just keep it quiet for now. Like, just, we'll be quiet. And in fact, he says in John 5, I do not accept glory from human beings. John 7, whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. I'm not seeking glory for myself, he says in John 8, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. See, Jesus, when he walked on this earth, he didn't go looking for the glory. He Instead, he pointed to the glory of the Father. And he said in his high priestly prayer, as he's praying to his father, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Jesus was doing the father's kingdom agenda. And he said, I finished that, I completed that by pointing people to you. And yet John says, we have seen his glory. And we know Jesus did show us his glory, right? In chapter 2 of John, we find the wedding at Cana where where he, he turns the water into wine. And most people there had no idea what just happened. They had no clue that Jesus turned water into wine, that they had run out. We find in chapter 11, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, right? And and not like he just happened to pass out for a couple hours. He was four days in the tomb dead, and Jesus raised him. So did we see his glory? Absolutely. John says it. We can see it in all the stories of the miracles Jesus did. And it tells us more about Jesus, that this verse says he is the only son. I mean, parents, if you're a parent, you love all your children. And when that first child is born and you love them with all you, all you have, you can never understand how you can have love for a second child. And the second child comes and there's really no problem loving them. And the same with a third or, or a fourth or a fifth, depending on how many you're going to have. We have all kinds of love for our kids. But it points out Jesus is the only son. You know, when, you, when you're an only child, you have that same love from your parents, but you also have something else. You have all the focus, right? And John makes it clear that as far as God is concerned, he has one son, and this is Jesus. 
And in the God the Father is telling us, he's pointing us to his son. He is the only son. He's the only son of the Father. Like I said, he's the, God the Father is the first person of the Trinity. We talk about the Trinity as three equal persons, right? And yet there is a subordination within the Trinity, right? God the Father is the first person of the Trinity. Jesus, as the Son, is the second person. And Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. And yet they all work together as God. But then we come to this, this line, this part of the verse that I really want to focus on today, and that says Jesus is perfectly full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. They go hand in hand, and we all, we all understand that. And like I said, Jesus is full of them both. It's not some kind of continuum where he just knows where the right balance is at any given time. Think of it this way. If you, if you ever had to do vehicle maintenance, right? Your vehicle needs oil and your vehicle needs gas. And if you have, if you have all oil and no gas, you're going to be well lubricated, but guess what? You're stranded. But if you have all gas and no oil... You can probably go gangbusters really quick, but you're going to seize up that engine. Been there, done that. It's not a, good, not a good thing. And if you put the oil or the gas in the wrong place, you've got big trouble. And yet Jesus is perfectly full of grace and truth, right? These are two separate characteristics. He shows his grace when he's healing the sick. He, he shows his grace when he's giving sight to the blind or making the lame to walk or really if you see it the thief on the cross beside him there's a lot of grace given to that thief and yet jesus also is all truth right he's always truthful now i know sometimes you you get to know people in in different way and you recognize some people you need to be a little more straight with them you you can't be so you know you can't sugarcoat things for them so they don't misunderstand But Jesus, when he was the straightest, when he was the most blunt, was usually with the religious leaders, right? And because they were the ones that should have known better. They should have known what the law was saying about the law, but they created all these rules to go around the law. They they put burdens on the people, and Jesus was very blunt with them. They should have known better. But we also see Jesus using grace and truth at the same time. Think about the, his interaction with Zacchaeus, right? Zacchaeus, you remember Zacchaeus? He was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. If some of you are older, you've got the song in your head now. You're welcome. But, but he met Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was hated by people. And, and, and yet Jesus came into town and said, Zacchaeus, I want to have dinner with you at your house. He showed grace to Zacchaeus, this man that nobody liked, came to his house for dinner, and then we don't know exactly what happened in the dinner, but we know that afterwards Zacchaeus kind of repents and confesses what he's done and begins to want to make restitution. Jesus said something during that meal. He shared truth with the grace for Zacchaeus. Or when Jesus meets the woman of Samaria at the well, right? He's bringing his disciples and says, no, we need to go through Samaria. And the Jews never went through Samaria. They always went around. It was longer, but they bypassed it. But Jesus went into that town, and he showed grace and spoke truth to that woman. And because of that, many believed in Jesus. There was an article written a couple of years ago by um, Kevin DeYoung talking about this, this whole concept of Jesus being grace and truth. And he, he put it this way. He said that Jesus really is all grace, all truth, all the time. All grace, all truth, all the time. In Jesus, we we see release from the tension of trying to balance which one, where do we go, grace or truth? And Jesus says, no, no, it's both. These are two separate and integral attitudes. And we often think of grace and we think of it being the New Testament. We think of, of the law as the Old Testament. But I think verse 16 here tells us something different. Let me read you verse 16 again. See if you catch it as well. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. Grace in place of grace already given. Now, I intentionally used the NIV this morning because it's the only one who translates that verse that way. 
most commentators, when I went and tried trying to find out what they said about this, all agreed that this was the idea, that this was the idea of grace upon grace. I think we're closing with that, that song this morning, but grace upon grace, kind of like grace is like the waves on the seashore just comes in again and again and again. And, and if you've walked with Christ any length of time, you've experienced that grace again and again and again. You know, God's mercies are new every morning. But then there's this one standalone commentator, and probably the one I trust the most. He says something different about this verse. D.A. Carson says that Jesus is, talk, is, Jesus is bringing grace in place of grace already given. In other words, he's bringing New Testament grace in place of the Old Testament grace. I'm not going to suggest that Carson's right and the others are wrong, or I'm not going to suggest the others are right and Carson's wrong. In fact, I think they're both right. And really, we have to look at the context of this verse, which verse 17 points to. See, this verse has is, is, is got a... a splitting these in two different ways, and so does verse 17. Verse 17 points to the law of Moses, right? The grace already given, and the grace and truth of Jesus, the new grace. But these ideas, they work together, I think. I mean, the Old Testament really does seem like a different, different set of rules, a different regimen, right? We see the regulations, the sacrifices, all the works that needed to be done under the law, but really, it's still a form of grace. Now, God, as sovereign, as creator, really, he could have created the world, set it all into motion, got everything created, and then sat back and just watched what we do to each other. Can you wonder what that would be like? He could have done that. But I think what he did for us was show us grace. See, he chose to love a specific people. He chose to love Israel. And he chose to give Israel a law or expectations of what he wanted them to do. And the law as grace really is God protecting ourselves, protecting us from ourselves. And I think mercy, grace and mercy kind of really go hand in hand as well. Right? Mercy, you could put it this way, mercy is not getting what I deserve. Right? Not getting what Jesus died on the cross for us taking our place, that's mercy. He got what I deserve. But grace is getting what I don't deserve, right? Eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. None of us deserve that. And yet again, Jesus' death on the cross opens up the way of salvation. That is grace. See, he stepped in and did for us what we could never do. And really, if, if, if you're following someone who loves you that much, you want to be a little bit more and more like them, do you not? Don't you want to reflect them a little bit? I mean, as reflections of Jesus Christ, we should be working hard, striving at being all grace, all truth, all the time toward those in our lives for the sake of the gospel. A reflection, right? A reflection is an image. It's a, it's a copy. The, the reflection will never be the reality. And I'm going to assume that this morning when you looked in the mirror getting ready to come, you didn't see the image in the mirror and think, oh, there I am, right? You, you knew that was a reflection. It's not the reality. It's an image of you. Or like you think about the moon, how the moon reflects the light of the sun. And that's something I've learned living out in the country is just how dark the night can be when it's cloudy, right? When it's cloudy and there's no re light reflecting off the moon, you can't see it very much at all. But on those winter nights when there's a full moon and the sun is reflecting off that moon, it is bright as day. You can see in the backyard, no problem. But the moon isn't the light. The moon is reflecting the light. The Apostle Paul said this to the churches in his letters. He says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I'm going to be an image, a reflection of Jesus. Follow me as I do that. And even the fact we call ourselves Christians, right? Christian, Christ one, little Christ. We are images, reflections of our Savior. I mean, we think about a young son sitting on the bathroom counter pretending to shave with dad. 
trying to be like dad. And see, following Christ should want to make us, should make us want to reflect him, to look like him. And that process that we, we begin is, is called sanctification. That's how we begin to look like Jesus. Sanctification is one of those big words preachers like to throw around, makes them look smart, right? But it's actually, it's, it's one of three phases within the Christian life. Justification, sanctification, glorification. And justification is simply that point when you submit your life to Christ. That instant, you are now seen as justified in the eyes of the Lord. It's a one-time act, right? I have been saved from the penalty of sin. I have been saved from the penalty of sin. And at that moment, your sanctification begins. And through the rest of your life, you will be on this journey of being more and more sanctified, more and more like Jesus. I am being saved from the power of sin. As the Spirit works in us and through us. And that doesn't end until glorification. You know, when Jesus returns for us, or when you pass away, your sanctification ends and you begin your glorification for eternity with Jesus in the kingdom. And maybe you're wondering, like, so if I'm supposed to look like Jesus, why do I feel like a broken or foggy mirror? Well, the simple answer is because you can't make yourself look like Jesus. You, you just can't do it. And I don't mean to discourage you. I don't mean to suggest you don't measure up. It's not the case. But the reality is we can't do it on our own. We, we really need the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us to make us more and more like Jesus. And so reality, sanctification, is this partnership between you and the Spirit that makes you more and more like Jesus. And we do our part in our humanity, in our frailty. We do as best we can. And then only in our frailty can the Spirit step in and say, no, I've got the rest. I'll keep moving you. There's this old phrase, and I'm not even sure where I got it from, but it says this. It says, work like it depends on you and pray like it depends on the Spirit. Work like it depends on you. Pray like it depends on the Spirit. In other words, you can't just sit at home and say, I'm just going to go home. I'm just going to pray that I become more and more like Jesus and just sit on the couch, kneel by the couch, and just keep praying, 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 and never do any work in your sanctification. But the reality is, you do need to do some work. But like I said, you can never do it yourself. You need to pray like it depends on the Spirit. So you go and you do the work. You figure out, how can I read my Bible? How can I study? How can I pray? How can I evangelize? And you're praying, Spirit, work in me. Show me. Help me. Help me do what you need me to do. And I'll tell you, the verse isn't in the Bible that says God helps those who help themselves. I looked for it one time. It's not there. We need to work on our sanctification with the Spirit. We need to work at being all grace and all truth all the time. How does that look in, in, our, in our public life? I, I think James 1.19 kind of gives us a bit of a view on how this can look in our life. That's where it says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. See, it's only by listening and watching and praying that we can live this grace, truth life. And the big problem that we all have is that our grace and truth buckets were, were made imperfect by sin in the Garden of Eden. It'll never be perfect here for us. But we need to work at it. We need to try and be more and more like grace and truth. Because the important thing to remember is this, that grace without truth is a problem. And truth without grace is a problem. Truth without grace breeds a self-righteous legalism that poisons the church and pushes the world away from Christ. This is Randy Alcorn writing. He says, grace without truth breeds moral indifference and keeps people from seeing their need for Christ. Stop and think about that for a second. In, in life and how that, how that happens. He explains, he says, attempts to soften the gospel by minimizing truth 
keep people from Jesus but also attempts to toughen the gospel by minimizing grace, keep people from Jesus. See, it's not enough for us to just offer grace or truth. We must offer both. All truth and no grace is brutality. All truth, no grace is brutality. Truth is important. It's very important. You can't fix brokenness without clarity, without truth. But you need to understand and acknowledge that truth. But see, when you have truth without grace, uh, it can be more destructive than helpful. Let me give you a little silly scenario, okay? Say you're uh, going out with some friends, maybe you work with them or they're from school, and you're going to go out for a dinner, but, but they say, hey, bring someone with you, bring a friend. And so you bring someone from church, okay? Someone that you know really well. They don't know the people you're eating with. And that you go for dinner and... And your friend, uh, you look over and they've got broccoli stuck in their teeth, okay? And you want to make sure that they get that broccoli out of their teeth. You say, hey, you got broccoli in your teeth. The whole table's now been notified there's broccoli in their teeth. Was there broccoli in the teeth? Yeah. Should it be removed? Absolutely. But you've now embarrassed your friend by telling everyone about the broccoli in their teeth. Again, Kevin DeYoung writes about this. He says, truth people are easy to admire. Think about those truth people you know. They're easy to admire, right? Because they have convictions. They have principles. They stand up for what's right and wrong. They set standards. They speak out against injustice. But when I say truth without grace is brutality, it's because that becomes a, an excuse for belligerence, right? You call someone on their, their harsh truth and they say, well, I'm just telling the truth. You don't mean to lie to them, do you? See, truth people are loyal to their cause, but we wonder if they're loyal to us. Truth people want to make us better, but they have no room for mistakes. Truth people make difficult decisions, but they make life difficult for us. So then really, we should just be grace people, right? Let's go the other extreme. Problem is that all grace, no truth, is hypocrisy. Grace is important just like truth. But an overemphasis on grace might mean there's no immediate backlash in a situation, but usually that means there's going to be something bigger happen down the road. Let's go back to the broccoli in your friend's teeth. Hope there's not broccoli for snack out there today. A grace person may see that broccoli and be like, oh, I don't want to draw attention to the broccoli in their teeth. So I'm just not going to say anything at all. Nothing said at the dinner. No one notices. You go home. Perfect. It's great. Grace abounds. But then the next day, you go to back to work where your work colleagues are or back to school, and everyone's talking about what a great time everyone had that night, last night. And then you realize they're making fun of your friend. Everyone saw the broccoli. You thought you kind of got rid of the situation by just ignoring it. But now these people you work with, these people you go to school with, are actually making your friend the butt end of their jokes. So did, did, did all that grace really help the situation? We need to be grace and truth people. See, grace people, when they're all grace, they're pleasant to be around, right? They, they don't expect anything of us. They don't ruffle feathers. They always cut you some slack. But we wonder. We wonder if they're pleasant to be around, but do, we, do they actually like me or do they want to be liked? Grace people are tolerant, but do they know the difference between right and wrong? Grace people demand nothing from others and they get nothing in return. But Jesus is full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. He didn't need to figure out the balance. He just oozed them both. So at the dinner, instead of announcing to the table that your friends got broccoli in their teeth, instead of ignoring it and hoping for the best, 
you find a way to subtly let your friend know, hey, you got some broccoli in your teeth. Send them a text if you're allowed to do that at the table. But let them know and help them save some embarrassment. See, that kind of a person, that grace and truth person, they're loyal to their cause, but they're also loyal to us. They, they accept us for who we are, but they help us become who we should be. They're clear and compassionate. They're truthful. They're graceful. Now, I don't know about you, but I need that in my life. Do you need grace and truth in your life? I know I need that. And we all need that because we should be showing this all grace, all truth, all the time towards others in our lives. We all need that person in our life, but you know what? You need to be that person for someone else. The reality is that your neighbors are not my neighbors. The people you work with are not the people I work with. The people you go to school with are not the people I go to school with. And that means you have more influence in their lives than I will ever have. And so you need to be grace and truth to those around you. And not just so that we can be nice people, but for the sake of the gospel. That's why we do this. See, our verse that we're looking at is, is the beginning, the opening of John chapter 1, the whole book of John. And at the end of the book, John tells us why he wrote this, right? John chapter 20, he says, look, there are so many more things Jesus did and said that couldn't be included here. But verse 31 says this, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. See, Jesus, John isn't writing about Jesus being full of grace and truth because it's just a good way to live. I mean, it is a good way to live, but it's not the point. John's saying, I want you to know this for the sake of the gospel because Jesus isn't just this nice, good teacher. He's the Son of God. So does that mean that we should take every conversation with people to the cross? I might shock you by saying no. In fact, I might shock you by saying, please don't always take every conversation to the cross. I know you're shocked. But let me tell you why. See, there will be instances where you could walk up to someone on the street, you could share the gospel with them, and they are going to turn to Christ right that moment. But the reality is, the Spirit's been working in them for a time. And you get to witness the fruit. But others need more time. There's a good book, and I, if you're getting into evangelism, this is a great book. It's called Tactics. It's by Greg Kukul. I want to read you a few paragraphs, and I think you can follow them on the screen. He explains this and why we don't take every conversation to the cross, okay? I think that in some circles, there's pressure for Christian ambassadors to close the sale as soon as possible. When pressed for time, get right to the heat of the message, get to the gospel. If the person doesn't respond, you've done your part, Shake the dust off your feet and move on. That is sharing truth, right? Not a whole lot of grace there, though. He says, a wise ambassador, though, weighs his opportunities and adopts an appropriate strategy for each occasion. Sometimes the simple truth of the cross is all that's needed. The fruit is ripe for harvesting. Bump it and it falls into your basket. That's what I was saying about the, you meet someone on the street and share the gospel with them, and they are ready. They are ripe for harvest. Usually, though, he goes on, the fruit is not ripe. The non-believer is simply not ready. He may not even have begun to think about Christianity. And dropping a message on him that, from his point of view, is meaningless or simply unbelievable doesn't accomplish anything. In fact, it may be the worst thing you can do. He rejects a message he doesn't understand, and then he's harder to reach the next time. You go to the cross too soon, you actually end up pushing people away. Now here is my own more modest goal. I want to put a stone in his shoe. All I want to do is give him something worth thinking about. I want him to hobble away on a nugget of truth he can't simply ignore because it continues to poke at him. Have you ever been out for a walk or a run and you get like a tiny little piece of gravel or even just like a piece of sand in your shoe? 
It's incredible how much that just bugs and annoys you. Kunkel's saying, I want to leave that sand in his shoe that he can't stop thinking about where we were in the conversation. See, you should be living a life that outsiders might look at you and go, wow, they're different. But you can't just live that life hoping someday they're going to ask you why you're different. It doesn't actually happen all that often. You do have to share the gospel eventually. You have to get to the cross eventually. And I know it sort of sounds like, Dave, you're saying this is pretty easy to do. I'll I'll tell you, it's not easy to live that life. But it is simple. It is simple to live this life when you have a plan. Have you ever taken the time to figure out how will I share the gospel when I have the opportunity? How will I do that? See, preparation is very important. We know, we believe the Spirit can give us the words at the right time, and He will. But He also brings back what we've worked on, what we've what we study, what we've prepared. And there are lots of great tools and strategies out there, right? You could use the Romans road. Take someone through the book of Romans and show them, you know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is, cre- is, is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. There's, there's the bridge, or, or there's the seven spiritual laws, but I'll tell you my favorite right now is the three circles. And I know some of you know the three circles. You've been trained. Anyone come to the training in the spring that Pony Church came and did with you? Yeah. My daughter was one of your trainers. I learned the three circles this year because of her. But having a plan, knowing how you're going to share the gospel is so important. We live grace and truth for the sake of the gospel. Now, when you're getting ready in the morning and you look in that mirror, do you see someone who is reflecting Jesus more and more every day? It won't be big changes every day, but do you see incrementally changing to be more and more like your Savior? Not so you can be liked, not so you can be seen as some kind of a leader, but because you belong to Christ. And because you belong to Christ, you should be His reflection living all grace, all truth, all the time. And when you rely on the Spirit for that sanctification, you will begin to look more and more like Jesus. When you look back on the last year, the last couple of years, you might be going, oh, wow, Like the Spirit really is working in me. I really am becoming more like Jesus. And my hope is that as you do that, you will begin to look more and more like the real thing. And that you are looking forward to the day when he comes and takes you back to be with him for eternity. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we we are so grateful for the word that you've given to us. The written word where we can understand and, and learn your expectations on us, how you want us to live this life. But even more so, we are thankful for the Word, your Son, Jesus Christ, who chose willingly to step out of heaven, to to step out of eternity with you, to step into life with us, to take on the human flesh, to, to live and experience this life on this earth, even to the point of being tempted without sin. And Lord, Father, we are grateful that he was willing to go to the cross, to step in in place of us, to take the death that we each deserve so that we don't have to. We are forever grateful for Jesus Christ. Would you make us a people who are learning to be more grace, all grace, all truth, all the time for the sake of the gospel. We pray in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you stand as we sing the final song?
Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your grace on top of grace, and we are called to be that people of grace and truth. Dave, you heated the room up this morning. The AC broke down while you were speaking as well, so if you're feeling a little warm this morning, folks, that was going on as well. We are so thrilled to have Dave and Katie, James and Emily with us here this morning. Obviously, this is a great time for our congregation day of decision to this evening, 7.30, uh, members all expected to be here. If you would like to come and be part of that, you're not a member of our church, only members will be called upon to vote, but if you'd like to be part of what happens tonight, come back and join us, but hang around now. We've got some uh, frosty treats out there, there's some cool treats, the foyer is cooler than it is out there, so make your way out there, but I'm going to ask Katie and Dave to come up to the front. If you'd like to come and give them your personal greeting, spend kind of a few minutes with them, give other people opportunities, and then kind of circulate around. When you get out in the other room, get your treats and then move on so that we can kind of have a, a circle happening out there. All right? And God bless you as we uh, share together in today. In Romans, we read this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, go in His grace. Amen. Amen. 